Have you noticed uh, certain biomarkers uh, for folks who maybe are, you know, went, I'm just wondering if you have any data, folks who go from standard American diet, let's say, and then they shift to a plant-based diet. Um, what would someone expect in terms of biomarker changes? I know this is pretty yeah. unique to an individual, but and, and any, you know, changes in sleep and, you know, heart variability, you know, is there anything that you know from the data that, that show? Yeah, so shifts? from a biomarker point of view, the further you shift along that spectrum, mm -hmm. the more the ApoB comes down. Mm -hmm. So we see from clinical intervention studies looking at essentially completely plant-exclusive dietary patterns, maybe a little bit of animal foods, but not a lot, you can get about a 30% reduction in your LDL cholesterol, which is you know, akin to a 30% reduction in ApoB, we would assume. They didn't necessarily measure ApoB in those studies, um, which is important. So if you're, if you're considered low risk of cardiovascular disease, so you don't have hypertension, type 2 diabetes, you haven't had a cardiovascular event, you're not a smoker, you want your ApoB at 80 milligrams per deciliter or lower. The average person in this country walking around is at about 120, 130. What does that mean? Well, that means that every day and every night they're laying down plaque in their artery. Yeah. We know that. There's studies showing that where you look at people that do not have other cardiovascular risk factors but have varying levels of LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And what you see is at this 120 to 130 level, which a lot of physicians would say is quote unquote normal. Is that a relatively sedentary individual or? No, I, well, you wouldn't assume we so. I mean, these are people that have normal blood glucose. Okay. They don't have high blood pressure. They don't have type 2 diabetes. So we would assume that they're, they're relatively healthy. They're going to mm -hmm. probably be moving their body in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And at 120 to 130, at least half of them have subclinical atherosclerosis. So they're yes. laying down plaque and it's not causing a heart attack or stroke at that point in time right. because it takes decades. So those people, if they don't get on top of that through diet or through pharmacology, will be one of the statistics when they're mm -hmm. 50, 60, 70 where they have a stroke or a heart attack. Uh, so you can you can expect about a 30% reduction in mm -hmm. that figure through diet if you take it more towards the, the extreme. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would say for people to navigate this. Mm -hmm. I think as you're making changes and you're sort of trading down on some of these animal foods, whether it's Mediterranean or pescatarian, retest. Mm -hmm. Where is ApoB at? Is it, if you're a low risk person, is it below 80? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Do you want to make some more changes? If not, if you say, I don't want to make any more changes. Well, maybe you can think about pharmacology mm -hmm. to help you get there. Right. So, or if you're high risk and so you've had a cardiovascular event or you have type 2 diabetes or you're a smoker or a combination of these, hypertension, then ApoB should be at 50 milligrams per deciliter or lower. Right. So you might be motivated to make more changes to your diet, mm -hmm. particularly if you're someone who's thinking, I don't want to be relying on a medication mm -hmm. well then that person might say you know what i'm going to make all the dietary changes that i can make mm -hmm. and yeah. they have a lot of motivation to do it and they can yeah. adhere to it uh, or again it might be a combination of the two blood pressure wise you can probably bring that down by 10 millimeters of mercury which i mentioned before yeah. which is about a 25 percent risk reduction in uh of, of stroke heart attacks mm -hmm. or other vascular events you will you would certainly see improvements in your blood glucose. So HbA1c, fasting glucose, but also triglycerides if you're not eating refined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. That's important. So again, with your carbohydrates are mostly coming from fruit, whole grains, and legumes, mm -hmm. not from packaged foods, right. cookies and cakes and pizzas and mm -hmm. white flour stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, how much those numbers will improve will be a little bit subject to whether or not you lose weight. If you do lose weight um, and you're able to reduce particularly the fat that is in and around your organs, mm -hmm. so visceral, visceral fat and, and ectopic fat, that's the really metabolically damaging fat. Right. And again, I said before that one of the, one of the sort of um, nice things about these dietary patterns is they're low calorie density. Right. So they can help people lose some weight and clear out some of that visceral fat, the ectopic fat that 
is leading to the insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar. Right. Um, so they can really improve their metabolic health and you know, lower inflammation. I mentioned before, mm -hmm. there are a number of things that people see on their blood tests. You mentioned sleep. Again, if you lose weight, you're going to sleep a lot better. Yeah. If you exercise more, you'll sleep a lot better. Yeah. Um, so all of these things are kind of tied together. Yeah. Our members have the ability to track various diets. So we have as options, you know, paleo and vegan and vegetarian and intermittent fasting regime, which I really want to ask you about, um, and ketogenic and dairy free diet. Yeah. What and, do you see? I'd love to know. Oh yeah. I have those data. <laughs> Can you guess? <laughs> oh, I, th I think probably any number of those are, is probably better than a standard American diet, but I'm betting that a lot of people are using Whoop aren't, aren't eating a standard American diet. Yeah. I mean, we definitely trend toward the healthier <laughs> uh, folks without a doubt, but, um, but yeah, we, so we basically took, um, all the members data who are tracking these things consistently. We took all their data, um, from the month of June. Yeah. And we found that, um, the average resting heart rate among members across all six diets um, was actually lower than the average in, of the age and gender matched group. So we had kind of an age and gender match control group. And then we had all these people attracting diets and the vegans saw the lowest resting heart rate and theirs was 55 beats per minute compared to the gender match group, which was 60 beats per minute. Did that, did you look at recovery? Did that translate um, to better recovery or? Yep. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, I guess just wondering, you know, I, I think you kind of uh, alluded to this, but I think the lower, the, the less inflammation, the lower your resting heart rate, generally, the better your sleep, but would love to hear just your thoughts on why you think um, the lower resting heart rate, um, you know, for the, the, the vegan group was, you know, even maybe uh, even, Look, even I, above I, I'd vegetarian be, hypothesizing here, because yeah, I course. haven't seen, I mean, yeah. this is interesting for me, because I've kind of wanted more data to speak this to this kind of because data, yeah. anecdotally and i don't love anecdotes yeah. but anecdotes can be more interesting when there isn't any data out right, there right and anecdotally uh, one of the kind of areas where you hear a lot of people adopting a plant-based particularly vegan diet is towards the end of their career so it's like the older athlete who's having difficulties re with recovery right it's and not adapting say, as well as maybe they were previously and, and they'll say yeah. that their sleep improved and their recovery time improved and to date, you know, the, the hypothesis has just been that, well, they're probably less inflamed. And my lab tests sort of corroborate that in terms of my inflammation is extremely low. So is my visceral fat. Yeah. So on my DEXA scan, my visceral fat was 0.01 pounds, which is basically Dang. nothing. Yeah, and, and I think that that comes back to this too. So that comes back to the type of fat mm -hmm. that we're consuming but also whether we're in a calorie surplus or right. not so i'm very active i'm probably not in a calorie surplus often right and my fats are mostly unsaturated mm -hmm. and when you keep that visceral fat down yeah. you, you will reduce inflammation yeah. a lot that visceral fat is very inflammatory so um i mean that's interesting yeah. data but it, i think it probably ties back to inflammation yep and heart rate variability the vegetarian diet saw the highest heart rate variability that group was 59.47 mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so anything different in the vegetarian diet that might yield a kind of higher um, HRV, which is, you know, good corollary to recovery and you know, yeah. inflammation. Uh, I mean, what are vegetarians relative to, to vegans are often getting a little bit more calcium, potentially a little bit more protein. So, mm -hmm. you know, those are usually the two big differences in the diet. I'm not sure how those are interacting with HRV, but again, mm. interesting. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, and also sleep quality and duration and consistency. So the degree to which you stabilize mm -hmm. when you go to bed and you wake up, which is more behavior routine type thing, was definitely it was best in the, um, the vegan and vegetarian group.